Praise God. How many of you are thankful that you are a child of the Most High God tonight? Great and mighty God of heaven. To be his child, what a wonderful thing that is. Hey, I am so thankful for the opportunity to be here tonight. I don't want to spend a tremendous amount of time in preliminaries. If you're a preacher of the Word of God, you understand what I mean when I say there are times that um, you have a certain heaviness in your spirit to preach. And um, I feel that tonight, a little different than Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. And so uh, we're going to just preach from that and just ask the Lord to smile on it tonight. Uh, It's always good to meet new folks, some that we've never met before. Uh, It's good to have Brother Philip with us tonight. Good to have you, son. That's right, Philip. Philip Tapp, is that how I said it? Did I get it right? Good to have you with us. He was in service with us down in Florida not too long ago, and Sister Youngblood in the back. Praise God. So always wonderful. She came, uh, traveled a long way to be here with us Uh, last time, I believe it was. We were in South Carolina a couple of years ago, and I'll never forget, she was, boy, she was what we call down in Florida, she was a book at it, and she was coming around the mountains and all that, and uh, when she showed up, her uh, brake pads were literally on fire, and uh, they were smoking, from smoke coming out of them and whatnot, and she was really moving on. She was trying to get to church, you know what I mean, and some of those places in the mountains, you know what I mean, you got to get your foot on the brake and uh, what have you, but it's always good to see all God's people, and I don't want to miss anybody. We're thankful for everybody that's here. Hopefully you know that, but how many of you know that it's not all about us tonight? It's not necessary. It's about, about the Lord, and so if I don't call your name, please don't get uh, your feelings hurt or anything of that nature. I don't know everybody that is here, but I, I have come here with one mission and intent, and that is to obey God. And with the Lord's help, we're going to do that. I've been chasing a little bit of an issue with my throat this week. I don't really know exactly what it is. It's a little weird. Uh, it's not like uh, typical when you preach and you preach your voice out. Just something kind of odd. And uh, you don't have to worry. I don't believe it's any kind of a, that, uh, uh, what they call it, China virus or nothing like that. We didn't have that. Uh, praise God. But I do believe tonight that I'm thankful for the fact that even in the midst of the difficulty to minister and to preach God's word, that God's always faithful to show up. Amen. One songwriter put it like this, he may not come when you want him, but he'll always be there on time. So praise God. We have already made the the mention in previous services uh, that we are thankful about uh, the opportunity and the hospitality we've been shown by the Pitts family. We love them very dearly, and uh, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I'll tell it to anybody, anywhere we go, uh, there's a certain kinship among people that you have familiarity with, uh, certain common things, you know. And I can see a lot of their same values and desires about ministry and that sort of thing as to our ministry that God has placed us in. So we're thankful for that. Also thankful for my wife. I, I wouldn't want to go anywhere without her. We ha- I've had to preach before without her, and it just isn't the same. Uh, if you know anything about my ministry at all, if it wasn't for her, probably wouldn't have much of a ministry, her and the Lord. But I'm so thankful for her. Wonderful. I got one of the best wives a man could ever ask for, and I'm grateful for that tonight. But what do you say we jump into God's Word tonight? So if you get your Bibles and uh, if you'll turn with me to the book of Jeremiah chapter 7 and stand to your feet tonight. Jeremiah chapter number 7, verse number 9. When you find it, if you will look this way, smile at me like you love the Lord. Amen. Jeremiah 7 and 9. Still here a few pages turning. Give you a moment to get there. Like I said, just feel a very unique burden on my soul. You that minister in the Word, if you will, pray for me tonight. I just want to obey God. And uh, services like this that really take something out of you. I can't really explain it. It really does. Just pull something out of you. But I believe that the sacrifice is worth it when somebody gets the help. If you have it, say amen. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, and swear falsely, burn incense unto Baal? 
Walk after other gods whom you know not. And come and stand before me in this house. What audacity. Which is called by my name and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go ye now unto my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it, for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these works, saith the Lord. And I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not. And I want you to listen to this part. This just really grabbed me. And I called you, but ye answered not. Will you read that again with me? And I called you, but ye answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. Lord, that just grabs me. What a, what a scary thing. Praise God. With the Lord's help tonight, I'd like to preach on this thought. Never preached this before, and I need the Lord's help on the unanswered call. The unanswered call. Now, Brother Pitts has asked us to pray over this message and service, I believe. And, but here's what I'd like for us to do. I'd like for us, for the next few seconds here, I'd like for you to pray for the people who really need this tonight, that they will actually answer the call. Will you pray with me tonight? Lord God, tonight we're so thankful for the privilege to receive the engrafted word of God. I'm asking you for the next few moments, God, that you'll bring such a thick fog of conviction into this place, God, that you'll arrest the attention of every person that is desperately in need. God, if you would use me for the next few moments to come to those that are in need the way that you did with David in his time of sin and get his attention, as you said in the word of God, I am asking you tonight, God, to fulfill it and make it so right here in the next few moments. Speak like you haven't spoke all week long. In Jesus' name, everyone can say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to plow a little bit if you'll let me do that for a while. But chapter number 7 of the book of Jeremiah begins with the Lord telling this man of God to stand in the gate of the Lord's house like some sort of town crier with a message crying, amend your ways. That's not a popular message. Now, if you're the man of God that has to go to people and tell them, get right, pull it together, do what the will of God says, you're not always going to be a popular person. You'll only be popular among the people who love the truth of God's word. I'm one of those that I believe if you really love God, you love holiness preaching. I just believe that with all of my heart. But you see, he let the people know that if they would do what was right and serve God, no other gods but God, that God would ensure the certainty of their habitation in this good land that God had given them. But on the other hand, there's another side to this coin. If they would not, and they refused to follow after God, he would do to them what he did with backsliding Shiloh. What a sad thing that it is to imagine that somebody could go through what Shiloh did, and here we've got another group of people. It's almost as if some people just never learn from other people's mistakes. It's almost as if they've got to do their own thing and fail themselves to see and learn for themselves. But by the time that we get down to verse number 13, God says, you have done all of these wicked things 
And to make things even worse, if that wasn't bad enough, I rose up early speaking to you and calling to you, but you would not answer. Somebody say, that's a sad thing. God said, I've been trying to get your attention. I rose up early in the morning. I was trying to talk to you, but you would not listen. You wouldn't answer me. So as a result of all of this, we see God's word shows us that God determined to judge them just as he did with Shiloh. Now, I don't know, but I began to think in my own humanity and I began to think to myself, oh God, what would it be like if God was to come to me? What would it be like if God come to you tonight and he was to tell you that he alone was responsible for the destruction and the tragedy that hit a family that you knew, a preacher or a church or somebody that had been in sin and God brought that destruction to their house and God told you if you don't get right, it's coming your way. Oh, God, how would that feel tonight to know that God had called your number and God said, look, there have been things you've seen since you've been saved. There have been people's lives that you've watched that have been a train wreck, that have been a mess, and you saw it with your own eyes. And if you don't get it right, and if you don't pray through, you might be the next one. Somebody say, God, help us all. I believe that tonight, that as we look across the church world as a whole, the Christian community seems to be one that today talks a whole lot about God's mercy, about God's love, and about God's grace, and all of these beautiful things. And surely that God is a God of love, and God is a God of mercy, and grace, and peace, and all of these things. But I believe that this same generation would love to talk about his mercy, but they want to distance themselves from ever thinking that God might just possibly be a God of judgment. But I want you to know that his word shows us that he is a God of judgment. Say amen, somebody. You see, in Jeremiah's day, he was without a doubt a God of love and of mercy. Now, how do you believe that, Brother Myers? Didn't he tell him that he was going to make him like Shiloh? Didn't he tell him that he was bringing destruction, he was bringing tragedy, and all of these things and judgment? Oh, yes, he did. But there's something you cannot miss about it. You see, after all that we read in the Word of God, there's two words that stand out as I got out and prayed and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, and that was he tried. Somebody say that with me tonight night he tried now you can point your finger back at God and you can say God why did my marriage end up like this God why did our church go through a split God why did we have this happen in our life why did we suffer this loss do you know that there are times in our life that that God has honestly made a good concerted effort he tried to show us he tried to get our attention but yet God has tried and tried while that we just turned a deaf ear and we would not listen to what God had to say to us you see he rose up early in the morning. God was showing us, amen, a type of analogy, if you will. You know, when you get up early in the morning, that is the time of the day that you've yet to get busy about the things of the day. While you're not distracted in the peace of your mind of trying to get up and out of bed, God tried to speak to them when they didn't have a lot going on, but still it yet they would not listen. They had turned a deaf ear to God. God. The Lord said in his word, you would not answer. I've tried and I've tried. And with the Lord's help, that's what I'm preaching on tonight. Because see, the reality is uh, this is an unanswered request of God. This is a plea and a petition of God that God is desperately trying to get somebody's attention. <coughs> Praise God but they've turned him off. It's as if there was a power button or there was some sort of mechanism that they reached up and they turned God off. I remember being a teenager. I was in a boy's home for a little while 
And I'll never forget this. We had a boy there that was deaf and he couldn't hear very well, but uh, partially deaf in one ear, completely deaf in the other. And he wore a hearing aid in his ear. And when the staff parents of that boy's home that I was a part of, when they would get on to him, Brother Travis, and he didn't want to hear what they had to say, he would reach up to his hearing aid and he would shut it off as if to say, I don't want to hear you and I don't want to hear you. There were times that I didn't want to be deaf but I almost envied the fella because there were times in life that I wished that I could tune some people out. There were times I wished that I could reach up and turn it off. But I want you to know this nation that Jeremiah spoke of reminded me of many stories that I have experienced and things that I've watched with my own eyes as a man of God. But one particular story and one experience that I went through that seemed to shake me to the very core. Many years ago, we had early just started pastoring, and, uh, and I was trying to be the best pastor that I could be. We had not long started into homeless ministry, and I had a family come along who were going to be at our right side. They planned to help us in the ministry, and uh, you know, they, they didn't grow up in the church like a lot of folks did, but they seemed to love God, and on the surface, everything looked looked like that they really were gung-ho about doing the Lord's work. And I can still remember there was something about this family that was awful hard to pastor them. You know what it was? It was as if they were always going to outstrict everybody and outholy everybody. Everything about them, you could never live up to their expectation. Come on and say amen. Had one thing, y'all will let me preach tonight? Hope so. But after one particular service one morning, I will never forget this by God's grace. Our children were playing together in one of the side rooms of the church. And uh, I didn't know there was a problem until after church. Has anybody else, another pastor, got those folks who after church, they've always got a problem? Bless your heart. You're driving a lot of people crazy. But after church, about 30 minutes or an hour later, I get a phone call, Brother Myers. And I'm like, oh, Lord, what now? Well, we can't let our daughter play with your daughter anymore. What? I mean, I'm just like, I'm, I'm, what? No, we can't let our daughter play with your daughter anymore because your daughter plays with baby dolls that got pants on. What? So I didn't know what he was talking about. So I told my wife. I said, what's he talking about? She said, honey, that's the craziest thing I ever heard. She said, "My our daughter, her name's Miranda. She said, Miranda's got an antique baby doll, and it's got a long dress on, and it's got long antique-like bloomers underneath, and that was what they were talking about. I'm not done yet. Y'all really going to blow your mind. And I, what I'm getting at is that they were, they were just all the time that nobody was as good as them. And it always made you feel like that you couldn't live up to their expectation. But I found that sometimes people like that have got skeletons in the closet and things that nobody else knows anything about. You see, time began to go on. And uh, I was doing homeless ministry. Things were going pretty well for a while. And uh, one night, Brother Timmy Baggett, some of you may know him. One night, Brother Tim Baggett called me on the phone. And he said, Brother Myers, I got to tell you something. I said, what is it? And uh, me and Brother Tim, we known each other a long time. I used to joke with him. I said, if anybody going to let me know, it be you, brother. He, he called me up and said, I got a problem. He said, you might want to sit down for this one. I said, what is it? He said, well, you know that brother in your church? I said, yes. 
he said, well, he said, there's another church that was in our fellowship in South Florida at the time. There were two ladies in that other church. Why? I don't have time to get in. What? How? I don't know. But somehow or another, these two other ladies got this idea that this preacher was in this chat room and so they thought they were going to be private investigators and they thought, yet we think we know who this guy is. So, Brother Jonathan, they put a request in. They type, type, type it out and they said, send us a picture of yourself. Well, all of you that are here of an adult mind, the picture they got was not the picture they thought they would get. Here's a man who's playing the role of a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We were going into the highways and hedges. If I laid hands on him and prayed for him, he'd shake like a fish out of water. He'd get up and sing and play the guitar. But in behind the scenes, uh, there was something wrong. But let me tell you something, church. What God began to show me is that during the process of all of this playing out, what blew my mind is that God had been giving me messages that I didn't understand. At the time, we had a log book and somebody in the church that kept a record of every service and they'd write down the titles of the different messages. I didn't understand why that God was doing this, but I do remember this. Before all that started playing out, one night I was getting ready for church and I told my wife, I said, I don't know why. I said, but here lately, I said, when I get around that preacher, I said, something don't feel right. Something don't, something don't jive with me. I can't put my finger on it. Uh, has anybody else ever had somebody that you feel like you, there's something I just can't put my finger on it? Years ago, I preached a message and the Lord began to show me how the Bible said take the call and the liver and separate it. And the Bible said take it outside the camp and bury it outside the camp. Get rid of it, in other words. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know what they use. I don't know if they use a wooden box. I don't know if they use a clay pot. But I, I thought that they had to put it in something. And it made me think about all the times that I had cleaned fish and put put fish guts in a bucket. And you know what we would do? We would dig a hole and dump fish heads and fish guts into the bottom of that hole. Well, you know, the problem is, uh, is that there are some people that come in among the church uh, and that God speaks to them the way he did in Jeremiah chapter seven. And they can shout with the best uh, and they've got a standard and they got it all looks like together. But what they do is, uh, is that when God said, take it outside the camp, my God, I feel like preaching tonight that when God said take it outside the camp, that they get out there and they start dumping it out of the bucket. But there's something they want to hold on to. Something they never get prayed through over. It might be the lust of the eyes. It might be the pride of life. But there's something that they refuse to let go of. And they walk around with that bucket of rotting guts and you get around church folk and you can shake hands you can smile you can talk the lingo you know we all got our lingo like one of them is we don't say holiness we say wholeness huh we come from the wholeness church they got to walk they got my god they got to talk they got it all down pat but there they are with that bucket and you get around somebody go, man, I, I don't understand. It's just, I don't know what it is, but I just sense, I smell something, I feel something, and something ain't right. Oh, yeah. Well, time began to go on, and he told me about that, and I immediately, I'll never forget, we were walking around Walmart that night, and I talked to his wife. He said, she's the first person I got a hold of. And I said, do you know anything about this? His wife went into hysterics, crying on the phone. You know why? Because mama knew that daddy had some problems that nobody else knew about. You see, they're so worried about an antique doll with some long bloomers underneath the dress. But my God, brother had a bigger problem than an antique baby doll. My God, I feel like preaching tonight. Amen. 
But but when I finally got a chance to talk to mama, here he come in the background. And of God's grace, I probably never forget it. Hope I wish that I never went through it. But in the background, it literally sounded like somebody sawing off a, somebody's leg with a chainsaw, crying and screaming and going on. Here I am walking through Walmart. I'm a new pastor, hadn't been pastor at all, and I got a major problem on my hands. That brother got so scared that his wife might find out he wasn't even thinking straight. He walked into the kitchen and got a butcher knife. She's on the phone. Brother Myers, he's got a butcher knife. I thought, my God, what's he going to do? Stab somebody? He walked over to the computer, reached down, and grabbed that butcher knife and sliced the cord, thinking somehow you might not find it. She said he just sliced the cord like an idiot. That's what she said. I said, yeah. I said, sis, that don't mean nothing. I said, you can still get into that computer. She's fussing at him, crying. How could you do this to our family? You are putting a mark on us. How could you do this to your home? I'm telling you that it nearly train wrecked not only any ministry he could ever have, but it put a stain on our ministry too. Why? Because he was going to our church when it went down. Fast forward about 10 years. I'm still preaching about the unanswered, that that unanswered call of God. When God deals with you and you refuse to listen. About 10 years maybe, it might have been longer. This family got back in touch with me. Still trying to poke along serving God. And if you know anything about me and my wife, we are some, we try to be very compassionate towards people. We try to be forgiving towards people because I've seen a lot of families and people go through junk and get it right and go on and do right for God. I mean, knows it can happen, right? So when they reached out to me, I was reluctant, not knowing what to expect, but everything seemed to be going well. And so the wife was living in one place that were trying to make a transition. So the daddy said, well, me and my daughter, the oldest daughter, we're going to come down there and uh, would you help us get a, a storage unit and uh, we'd like to start going to your church. Well, by this time, we were at the church that we're in now. Hadn't long been there and uh, God was blessing us real good. And so I said, all right, I'll get your storage unit. I went and paid out of my own pocket trying to help that brother out. Well, during that process, my daughter and children were still at home. And my daughter said, Daddy, do you think that his daughter can come and stay with us during that period of time? And uh, him staying at another place. I said, that sounds fine with me. I said, well, as long as you guys look after whatever needs she's got, that's fine. So Brother Pitts, she came and stayed with our at our house. Well, during that period of time, hey amen, we didn't understand or know exactly everything going on. My God, sometimes I wished I wouldn't have. And so, uh, he was coming to church. That She was coming to church. Hey amen, he, you could lay hands on him and I mean, he'd jerk and shake. Uh, you would think, my God, he had the victory of God. I mean, all over him. He was talking about maybe even preaching for me. I, I didn't understand, but I started feeling that feeling again I started feeling like something ain't right again and uh, one day I told my wife I said something sounds a little creepy and something sounds a little weird uh, about his daughter's story his daughter had begun to tell us uh, about how that there was this boy that she's never met in person never seen him with her physical eyes but a boy that reached out to her over the internet and and uh, she said well send me a a picture he sent her a picture and the picture was some very handsome young man so she was excited she's got a boyfriend now she's been dating this guy over the phone for over a year never met him never, never talked to him verbally just through text message or email or whatever. And I, I, I told her, I said, something's weird about this thing. Huh? 
Well, my daughter got talking to her one night. And she asked her, she said, what would you say that picture was that that boy sent you? So, oh, yeah, here it is. Showed her the picture. My daughter punched it into Google or whatever and pops up some dead teenage celebrity that had died years ago. Problem number one. I asked the young lady, I'm trying real hard because I don't want to put no names in here. I asked that young lady, I said, honey, do you, who do you think might be playing games with you? Boy, she's baffled, heartbroken. Well, I don't know, Brother Myers. In my heart, I felt like it was her own daddy. She began to tell my daughter things that some things I cannot share with you tonight. How that this, this young man supposedly had tried to be affectionate through the phone and told her one night in so many adult ways, well, since we cannot be together, maybe what you should do is go in and pretend that your dad is me. Anybody feel creeped out yet? She said, I got mad at him and told him, you're crazy. What are you? And he said, no, I was just kidding and played it off. To bring the story to a head for you to show you how crazy, the more I talked to, the more I began to show her. She said, Brother Myers, you don't think that could be my daddy? I said, well, honey, I said, what do you think? She said, well, now that I think about it, she said, there, there's been a lot of really weird stuff over this last year. Like what? Well, we went to the beach one day and uh, said, Mama went down with my sister to the beach to the shore and I was back there at the motel and something about how that her daddy went to take a shower and she was texting this guy. I think she said his name was supposed to be Chris or something. And she said, I thought it was weird that every time that I would send a text that my dad's phone a few seconds later would ding. She said, I thought, well, that's kind of weird. And I don't mean no harm, but this young lady, she was a blonde-headed young lady, and I don't know if you're blonde. I don't, I don't have blonde jokes, but she was a little dingy, but sweet as she could be. And that young lady... The moment that the shock came on her face, when she realized what had happened to her, she said, Brother Myers, I've sent, I'm embarrassed, but I've sent pictures to him. You know what daddy was doing? He found him an app on the phone. And he was truncating a phone number to an anonymous phone number pretending to be a young boy having his own daughter send him pictures. My God in heaven. Ten years later or more, I don't remember the time. But I got to thinking to myself, just like it was in Jeremiah's day, that town crier got up and he said, listen, if you'll obey God, He'll bless you right where you are. If you'll be good to God, God will be good to you. Amend your ways and do what's right. But do you know, if you don't, you're going to be about like backsliding shallow. God's going to bring down judgment. And God went on to say, I dealt with them. I tried. I said, God tried. He rose up early in the morning. He tried to get their attention, but they wouldn't answer. I can still shout. I can still speak in a tongue. I can still run. I mean, I got most of it right. So did he. 
The FBI got involved. The Sheriff's Department got involved. He took off and ran to a a psych place, a place where that they treat people with mental issues and admitted himself overnight, tried to pretend like he had lost his mind, acting crazy. All while that young girl was broken hearted in such confusion. You can, call, you can raise somebody up. You can treat somebody good. You can show them the right way and do and destroy everything you've ever built up because when God called, you didn't answer. When God dealt with you, you passed it off. I heard one preacher years ago, somebody told me one preacher said, he said, well, you know, I, I, I do a little bit of alcohol every once in a while. He said, but what I do, he said, is every time that I get to preach, I just repent before I get up to preach. I ask God to forgive me right before I get up to preach. Somebody else besides me that would agree with me, that is not the way it's supposed to work. You see, you keep playing games with God and you toy around with God. One of these days, God's going to let you become just like backsliding shallow. One of these days, God's going to get a hold of you and he's going to shake you and you're going to see destruction come. You say, why am I feeling what I'm feeling? Why? Because sometimes when you won't answer the call, God has to turn up the heat. The unanswered call. God, I want you to bless me. I want you to help me. And I want you to strengthen me. And I want to do right. But this one area of my life, I just I can't turn it over. I can't let it go. I can't get rid. I can't, sh- I can't get shook loose of it. And so God comes in the early morning hours. And he says, hey, son, hey, daughter, I've been trying to get your attention. I've been trying to talk to you. I've been trying to tell you some things, but you never got time for me. You're so busy with everything else, and you just keep pushing me off. You know what I found out about a lot of folks? I've learned a lot through raising children. I've got three. And my children know one thing about me and my wife. A lot of times if they, if they want to argue, if they want to hear what they want to hear, they sure ain't going to call daddy. Because I'm one of those, I made it up in my mind a long time ago. They're my kids, but if my kids are wrong, I'm going to tell them they're wrong. I don't care. Am I telling you the truth? Am I telling the truth? There have been times my son and my daughter-in-law, everybody's had issues. Come on now. And as much as I love my son, well, this and that. I said, no, boy, you're wrong. Come on. And you know why? Because right is right. Wrong is wrong. But you know what I figured out? When you start entertaining what people are telling you, as long as they like your response, They want to know what you got to say. But the moment that you say, now hold on, wait a minute. Yes, son, you did good over here. But this area right here, uh -uh uh-uh-uh. You did something wrong. You messed up. You need to get it right. And as soon as you start doing that, you get mad, poke out the lip, don't want to hear it. Listen. I didn't come to tell you what you want to hear. We could shout. If you want to shout service, rewind the tape, go back to Monday night, go back to, to last night. But every once in a while, God puts a burden on a preacher because God loves you enough that he will deal with your heart. That secret stuff that you think you got hidden up under the rug. You don't think nobody else knows about it. Every time that you've sat in a church service and God dealt with your heart and you chose to leave, shake the preacher's hand, smile to his face, knowing you got some dirt in the background that you never gave to God, knowing you got filth, knowing you got garbage and you never gave it to God. Let me tell you, I would to God that he would convict your heart tonight. It would be a hard, horrible thing for you to sit in a service and hear the same preaching everybody else did. Dying split hell wide open.
because you refuse to answer God's call. Boy, whenever I preach, Brother Pitts, with this burden on my heart, boy, I'm telling you, it takes something out of you. You just, you ignore him. That's right. Anybody else got a cell phone? There are times that I get a phone call from somebody. And if you're listening online, some of my church folk or somebody here that y'all know me and you call me every once in a while, if I don't answer the phone, that don't mean it's you. But I got some people that call me and they will talk and talk. I got one sister, love her to death. But if I get on the phone with her, I'll say, all right, sis. Okay, it's good talking with you. We love you. We'll pray for you. I'll say that a hundred times. All right, I'll let you go. All right, I'll praise God. And here I am. I've got a nail in one hand, a hammer in the other, and a phone like this. And All right, sister. And so people like that, when I get the phone call, there are some people I choose to ignore. And I let them leave a voicemail. And if all they're telling me is they got bubble gum stuck on their shoe and couldn't get it off, well, I, I will talk to them when I see them in church next time. Then I got other people. Listen, the older I get and the burden on my plate with ministry and having a full time, I own my own business. I mean, I'm stressed. And sometimes, I mean, anxiety and other things. Are and I got some people I love them to death of their call. And they're, they're, the way they tell a story by the time I get off the phone. I, I, I needed to, 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 to pray. Somebody pour water on me. And so whenever they call, I just ignore. Do you know how many times that people, in a time I've been a minister, I thought to myself, if every collective pastor, every minister here tonight, if you have, if you had a record, if you had an actual real time record of every time that you have preached a message and somebody failed to answer the call, buddy, let me tell you, there'd be a long rap sheet of all kinds of names. A lot of people. Amen. Whenever you, whenever God said, listen, come up out of that adultery and quit shacking up. And well, I was good with you. I, I love that preacher until he started telling me that. Because I don't want to hear that. Oh, let me tell you some folk. Uh, when the preacher starts preaching the truth, especially when that man of God's trying to tell you love, he's trying to rescue you from the flames of hell. Instead of getting mad about it, instead of not answering the call and ignoring God when God deals with you, the best thing you could do is answer that call and say, Yea, Lord, it is me. It's me. It's me. Sometimes we think that it's only sinners that don't answer the call of God. But I have met some people in the church leadership, pastors, choir leaders, Sunday school teachers, who that God loves dearly. And there have been times that he's been trying to change the trajectory of the path that they're on. But there's something they don't like. So they're not going to roll with it. They ignore it. God's called them to do a certain ministry. And they just keep pushing off. Well, you know my job. You know my church. My family, my wife, I, I, you got a million and one excuses. And God has dealt with you. He's r rose up early in the morning and he says, son, look at here. I want you to do this and I want you to do that. And you know he's dealt with you. Brother, am I right when I say that there are people that you've probably experienced this too. They will tell you. So oh, I feel God's calling me to the nursing home ministry. Fifteen years later. They're still sitting on our church pews and they still ain't done no nursing men at home. Pastor, I feel like starting homeless ministry eight years later and you still ain't done a single thing. God said, I stand at the door and I'm a knocking. And if any man will hear my voice and answer the door, he said, I will come in and I will sup with him. The sad part is, as I near the close of this, I'm just feeling the Holy Ghost conviction here tonight. Sister Tanya, y'all figure out who you're going to want to have get up here and sing here in a minute. But the sad part about it is the destruction that comes 
to lives because when God called, they wouldn't answer. I want to share one last story with you that just God keeps putting on my heart, and I'm going to share it with you. Many years ago, while pastoring, I, well, we might have been evangelizing during this time, I had a young man. I, I probably shared this here before, but maybe somebody hadn't heard it. But I had a young man that reached out to me. His name was Ricky. He said, Brother Myers, I need your help. I said, what's wrong, son? He broke down in tears. He said, I'm about to lose my marriage. I said, why? What's going on? He hung his head down. He said, can we talk? I said, yeah. So we set it up to meet over in Leesburg, Florida, a little place where there's a big old train in the park. We sat out there with the cars rushing by, sitting on a park bench. And he began to tell me. He said, Brother Myers, he said, I have a problem. I said, what is it, son? He said, well, I have a problem with women. I said, is that right? Yes, sir. He said, he drove a truck all week long as a dump truck driver, made real good money. Come Friday, Sister Barbara, he'd get his paycheck. And he said, the first thing I do, Brother Myers, I, this is back when, you know, y'all remember phone booths everywhere? He said, I go find myself a phone booth. He said, I go to the same one every time. He said, ain't hardly nobody can see me. He said, I start dialing 900 numbers with ladies on the other end of the phone who are paid to talk lascivious. And he said, I'll stand there and I'll spend my whole check before I even know it. Tears run down his face. I can still see him standing in front of me. He said, I'll spend my whole check. He said, and then... He said, I got to call my wife on the phone. Honey, what is it now? What's wrong now? Don't tell me you did it again. Yeah, I, I need you to go put some money in the bank. Because not only did he spend the money, he spent more money than what he made. His wife got so sick of it. She told me and my wife later, she said, I can't put up with it no more. She said, I'm to a breaking point. She said, I'm sick and tired of covering for him. We go to church and nobody else don't know about it, but I do. And she said, I got to live with it all the time. She said, I put up with this for so many years. She said, I can't deal with it no more. I tried to help him, Sister Barbara. I told him, I said, Ricky, I said, listen, son. I said, I'll help you every way I can. I said, but the first thing you got to do, you got to start one victory at a time. One victory at a time. Some things we like complete deliverance, but I, I'd love to tell you everybody gets it all of a sudden just like that, but some people, they get it a little bit at a time. I said, son, if, if you don't get it like a flash, one victory at a time. I said, do you remember when Samson killed that young lion? He said, yes, sir. I said, guess what, son? I said, if you come up on that lion and you don't kill it while it's still young, when you come passing by later, it's going to be bigger, stronger, and it's easier for you to get whooped instead of you whoop it. I said, what you going to have to do? I said, you're going to have to whip all them little lions. And I said, and every time you get a victory... I said, if you look over your shoulder, when you look back at that dead carcass of a lion, you can say, I got another one. I got another one. What do you mean, Brother Myers? Put it in real terms. He told me, he said, Brother Myers, he said, every time I pull up to a traffic light, it's an automatic thing. First thing I do, I look hard to the left. And he said, I'm looking at women with their little mini skirts on. He said, I can't help myself. He said, it's such a habit. I just do it out of natural reaction. I said, son, first of all, I said, let's break that first habit. I said, from now on, when you pull up a traffic light, I said, I want you to look hard to the right. Well, 
I said, the second thing, I want you to have some accountability. I said, you're going to have to tell your wife where you go, where you do it, and how you do it, and tell on yourself so you can't do it so easily. So he did. Every day, three to four times a day, he'd call me. I said, how you doing, boy? He said, I'm doing good. Praise God. If he was having a struggle, I said, call me. I don't care where you're at. I don't care if you got to call me, collect. He'd call me on the phone, Brother Travis. How you doing? Well, not so good. We'd pray on the phone. Boy, three months at least. It might have been longer. He was doing better than he'd ever done before. But he started lapsing. He started going back. He started going back to his old ways. I'd like to tell you tonight, I'd like to stand before this church and tell you, that this young man, his family got all worked out and everything was great. I got to be real careful what I say here tonight because I never want to shame nobody. Sometimes with this internet thing, things get around. I sure wouldn't, I want nobody to be hurt. But I'll tell you what, what's sad about it, his wife ended up finally leaving him. Went and found her somebody else who would treat her better. He went on with his life. His little boy later become, I don't know what he's doing now, but his little boy started getting older and started feeling like he should be a girl. When you start bringing foolishness into your home, it has a way of rolling downhill. I'm just telling you tonight, I don't know what your problem is. It might be writing bad checks. I don't know what your problem is. I don't know what it is that God's been dealing with you. God's been telling you to get up and go and you just keep sitting and staying. I'm warning you this night, said God. I have spoke to you in the midnight hour. I have convicted your heart. But you continue to turn me away, saith God. You will not turn me away forever, for I will be your judge, saith the Lord. <laughs> this is the night, saith the Lord. Do not push me away. Run unto me with your whole heart, and I will strengthen you and save you and redeem you, saith God. <laughs> We just stand all across the house of God tonight. Please, 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 please. I know that in a service like this, it may be an awful hard thing for you to muster up the courage. Go ahead and play something, sis. To take that step. But as saints of God are helping me pray all across this place, I wonder, is there one person tonight that might be willing to say, that's how serious that I am. I want help that bad. Well, Pastor Meyer, somebody might think something bad of me. You let them think what, you, what they want to. I guarantee you, I'd, I'd rather walk an aisle in, in spite of what people may think than to have to kneel, bow before that long white robe and the nail scarred hands eyes like a flaming fire and feet like fine brass oh God saints of God are helping me pray please oh I know God's reaching for you but I want to tell you if you keep on turning God away it might be your last call would you come God rose up early in the morning and dealt here's what I want you to do heads are bowed and eyes are closed maybe there's some saints of God here this evening then maybe just maybe there's some areas you know you could pray about but you it's, it's not necessarily you. You're not backslid, but you know you got some things to pray about. Well, you say, some of you saints of God, step out so that we don't have to make a spotlight on anybody. Come on, some folks are come to this altar. 
tonight and get in this altar. Will you come right now? Let's open up the gateway for someone else who really, 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 really needs God to do something. Come on, is there anybody? Oh, it takes a bold, a bold man and a woman of courage to override the flesh man. Come on, some are coming tonight. Is that you? Don't ignore it. Don't press end on the call. Don't push him off. Don't push him away. Come on, is there something in your life that you know you've wrestled with and it's got the best of you? I said it's got the best of you instead of you getting the best of it. Lord, I'm asking you tonight to touch our brothers. Lord, every need in their lives tonight, God, that they would lay it on this altar. You can leave this church tonight with more victory than you have ever had in your entire life. If you're playing the role of a church hypocrite, please stop. Put an end to it. Let tonight be the night that you say, I'm not doing it no more. I'm not going to fall like that no more. I'm not going to yield to it no more. I'm not going to go that path no more. God, if there's an area that we need to seek you in, God, if there's a place of our life that we need to give over and listen because we, we're so busy we had not had time to fully surrender, God, forgive me. There's some of you that you've been praying that God would give you an answer about some direction in your life. You came tonight hoping God would give you some direction. You don't know whether to stop give it to somebody else turn it over let somebody else start doing it or whether to keep on plowing I believe that tonight if God's calling you and he's there to answer you better answer the call you better respond to the call God I've been needing you to tell me I've been needing some direction in my life I need you to speak to me oh saints of God whenever you get done praying please don't just leave Please find somebody else and help them to pray. I feel like God wants to help somebody in this service tonight. Lord, touch these young men tonight, these brothers tonight. God, breathe on every soul that is here tonight with your spirit. Turn it over to God. God told us in his word, he knows. He knows all the ways of man. He understands what... He understands what's going on in the dark. He knows what's happening when nobody else is paying attention. Do you realize tonight that if you're not careful, you'll end up with an Absalom. You'll end up with family descendants that you pass that spirit on to that you don't get free of. Oh, if I've ever felt something to preach, I felt it tonight. And I'm telling you, God's dealing with people for a reason. God has a reason why he's reaching tonight. God has a reason why he's dealing tonight. God, stir up our pastors and our pastors' wives to have a great boldness. Lord, a strength to continue in this battle. To listen for the voice of God. To respond when God speaks. Darkness, for the saint who's going astray. For the saint.